Let's rehear the story that uh, Daryl just performed for us a little bit here from the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. We're just going to look at the first 12 verses if you'd like to follow along. On the screen, we will also have it along with some images from what is taking place. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the anointing spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, by which I don't think they mean disco clothing or anything like that. This is a reference to the angels. Verse 5, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary and the mother of James and all the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them like an idle tale and they did not believe them. But Peter, Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. It's a beautiful story. You know, the opening mood of that very first Resurrection Sunday, the thing that we call and celebrate Easter morning, is one of surprise, astonishment, even fear, confusion, and finally, wonder. Maybe that's appropriate. Easter, after all, is supposed to be a wonder. It is still a marvel, as Peter pondered it in our reading. But it's so easy to lose that sense, isn't it? In all of our holiday travel and the rush of getting together and having candy and eggs and ham and whatever else you do, bunnies, for Easter, we lose sight so easily of what this is really about. And maybe for others of us, the reality of Easter is so historically distant and remote that it's hard to grasp how it impacts our real life today. We might even be skeptical that what we celebrate today is actually what truly happened Okay, sure. Countless millions this very morning proclaimed the resurrection confidently, just as we sang the hymns that we had this morning, all across the world. But it still helps to know, doesn't it, that the original witnesses had to be convinced that it really occurred, just like us. Let's be clear from our reading and go back to the beginning of verse 1 of chapter 24, the women in our reading today did not go believing in resurrection. No. They didn't expect to see Jesus alive. They did not go to check and see if the tomb was somehow empty. They didn't do that. The fact that they took the anointing spices along with them for a decaying body shows what they expected to find. They had forgotten all the times Jesus had talked about the necessity for him to die and to raise again. And they went to the tomb only to anoint his body. But please, let's not blame them for being forgetful. Nobody was expecting a resurrection. The resurrection was as inconceivable for the first disciples as impossible for them to make sense of as it is for many of us today. 
Okay, granted, their reasons might be just a little bit different than ours. You see, back in that day, the Greeks of that era did not believe in a resurrection at all. In the Greek worldview, in which many in Jesus' day were educated, including the Romans who oppressed them, the afterlife was merely the liberation of the soul from the material body. Resurrection wasn't part of their idea of life after death. Well, as for the Jews, some of them believed in a future general uh, resurrection when the entire world would be renewed together. A time when all God's people would be given new life, but they had little concept of an individual resurrection to a new heavenly body. So what I'm trying to say here is the people of Jesus' day were not predisposed to believe in resurrection any more than we are. So we shouldn't be too shocked then at how surprised they were on that first Easter morning. Nobody had ever dreamed that one single living person, let alone the Messiah, would be killed stone dead and then raised to a sort of bodily life the other side of the grave while the rest of the world carried on just as it had done before. See, for these women, the first hint that something unexpected had happened is that the stone was rolled away which would normally have been guarded and required special effort to move since it weighed around two tons. What the narrative is doing is pretty brilliant here. It's leading us to the same sense of bewilderment. There's no detailed description of the moment that Jesus arose, is there? The emphasis isn't from Jesus' perspective, but from that of the witnesses who were experiencing what was happening that first morning. What Luke is doing is drawing us in. It's almost as though he's saying, yes, the earthquake and the angels opened the tomb not to let Jesus out so much as it was to let the witnesses in. And we're being included. So the angelic appearance frightens the women severely, and then as if that isn't bad enough, then they're chided for it. Why are you looking here? He's not here, but he has risen. Don't you remember what Jesus told you? Maybe not the most chill angels that we could think of. Can you imagine how these women felt, what they were thinking as they heard these words? Then, then they began to recall All those strange sayings that Jesus had said on the way down from Galilee to Jerusalem. And a new understanding gradually dawns. When we ourselves struggle with faith, recall that the disciples and other followers who knew the words of Jesus more than anybody and heard them face to face, yet they still needed to be reminded of them. We're not so different either. We need to be reminded just as well each and every Easter morning. As their eyes were opened, the women ran to tell the men the good news, but they didn't believe them. Some disciples referred to the women's story, as your Bible translation has there in the pews, as idle talk. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a little bit like they're accusing them of spreading rumors, but that's not exactly what was going on here. It's more like that we were saying with a little bit more sensitivity that maybe you're telling delirious stories because you're overwhelmed emotionally and you're in anguish because of your great loss. Have you ever noticed at certain moments in life it seems impossible for people to believe what they're being told? Have you ever had an experience like that? A time when you or someone else had news so unsettling and so unexpected that it took a long while for it to settle in or even to be believed. Like a December morning in Pearl Harbor in 1941. Despite many warnings, even when the Japanese zeros were flying overhead, many people could not react and did not react until the explosions shook them out of their lethargy. 
Or how about 9-11 more recently? Who could have believed driving to work that very morning, the twin towers that cast a shadow all across the city would both be no more by 10.30 a.m.? Sometimes it's just hard to believe what we're being told. Oh, and our text goes on and says that still other disciples thought the women were just dreaming. Hmm. A group of men not listening too well to the women. See, ladies, some things never change. (laughs) Have patience with us. Sometimes it's not others um, who are being incredulous, but it's us. We want more evidence before we're going to get our hopes up. And it's a good thing, then, that Dr. Luke piles up the evidence in his books, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. The fact of the empty tomb, which could not be refuted. Later, the testimony of numerous eyewitnesses, over 500, to the risen Christ. And maybe most of all, most of all, the long-term impact on the lives of Jesus' followers. You see, no hoax, no cover-up, no made-up lie could possibly explain how this small group of followers could suddenly transform into an explosive movement arising from a few timid, astonished, simple people to spread all across the Roman Empire, overwhelming it in only a few hundred years. Nothing could account for them giving away their lives for a lie. You wouldn't do that. Being willing to die as they did, sharing their faith far and wide. Nor could it account for the countless masses of people coming to faith in every ethnicity and in every culture across the world. Why would anyone do that unless something marvelous had really occurred. Oh, but that's the evidence that we have today, in hindsight. That hadn't happened yet on that first Easter morning. All they had to go by was the women's testimony, and they were having none of it. Yet, this is where I love this section of the scripture. Notice Peter. Oh, Peter. He's always like this. Peter cannot sit still upon hearing the report. He runs to the tomb. You know, I love the brevity of that report. What was going through his mind? I want to know. But I love his decisive response. You know, he's always like that. Always read the stories about the Apostle Peter, the first one to jump out of the boat and try to walk on water, right? He knew something was happening. And even though he failed his Lord and denied him three times, there was something that he needed to see firsthand for himself, if it was true. And and with no delay. And when he arrives, the translation of the word that we have there, I think in yours is the word marvel. He wonders, he ponders about what had come to pass. There's a slow realization which is taking place. Could it be true? Hope rising. You know, we can learn a lot from the Apostle Peter. We can run to the tomb too. That's what we're invited to do each and every Easter morning. You see, if if Jesus really has done it, If he is truly risen, it means that the story of the world, according to Luke and all the other gospel writers, is absolutely true. Jesus really is, then, the Son of God. He is the true and perfect Messiah King. He came to earth to die on a cross for us, and by trusting in him and what he has done there, we're spared from eternal judgment, and we're ushered into the presence of God for all eternity. His death means no death for us. His resurrection signals our eventual resurrection. Then, you see, 
Resurrection Sunday, Easter morning signifies the first day of a new era, a new creation. But you see, if Jesus was not risen, then the story of the world that Luke and others have been telling is just a fiction or something much worse. As a matter of fact, that's the point that the Apostle Paul makes when he writes his first letter to the Corinthian church. In chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, he says, If Christ isn't risen from the dead, then our faith is in fact useless. And we are still subject then to our sins and quite lost. And more than anyone, we ought to be pitied. So we ought to give this quest for the truth about the resurrection the same urgency that the Apostle Peter did. You see, too much is at stake. We ought to come to the tomb, that is to say, to look for the evidence ourselves. The truth of the resurrection is of supreme and eternal importance. It is the hinge upon which the story of the world pivots. It is the crux of the answer to the meaning of life. And when we do attend to this quest, we will find Jesus waiting for us. Let your hope rise. For those of us who believe then, and already know this to be true, what does the resurrection mean for our lives right now? You see, it changes everything for how we live in the present, not just in the future. How so? Let me give a few examples. Why is it so hard to face suffering? Why is it so difficult to face disability and disease? Why is it so hard to do the right thing if you know it's going to cost you your money, your reputation, your aspirations, even your life itself? Why is it so hard to face the death of a loved one or the reality of your own mortality? It's so hard because we think this broken world is the only world we're ever going to have. It's so easy to feel that this body that we have is the only one we're ever going to experience, but it's not true. You see, if Jesus is really risen, then your future is so much more beautiful and so much more certain than that. Run to the tomb. Ponder like Peter did. Hope is rising. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are now being raised up. And things which had grown old are being made new again. And that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things are made and made again on Resurre Resurrection Sunday. Your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray this in his name. Amen.